Welcome to another message from C3 Mumbai. For more information about C3 Mumbai, please visit our website c3mumbai.com or visit our Facebook page. Monday matters. We're talking about what happens after you have church. The more important part of your week actually, the point where you are actually spending most of your time. Uh, not to say that this isn't important, I'm not downplaying this, but I think an imbalance sometimes within uh, the church organization is so much uh, weight is put on what happens here in this room. And, uh, but really, where the most of the weight is, if we're going to make a change, if we're actually going to do anything practical in this world or do anything that counts, is actually you and your workplace and, and, and working out how God is working through you in that place. And it's not just about telling your friends about Jesus and telling them to come to church, although that might be something that you're challenged to do and it is something that we should do, but, but it's, it's more than that. It's, it's you and how you actually operate and how you are and, and, and the foundation of everything um, about you in your work. That's what we're talking into over the next few weeks. So we're two weeks in. This is week two. Um, last week, uh, the title was Work. Is it, uh, is it Worship or Worshipped? Worship or Worshipped. Um, it can be one of two things. We can uh, end up using it as worship. And, and the way that we would use it as worship is to follow the greatest commandment that Jesus gave and let it seep on through into our workplace who knows what the greatest commandment Jesus gave was? To basically to love God and to love people. Love God and love people. And I was talking about how we are so looking for our calling. Well, that is actually our primary calling as followers of Jesus, is to love God. And to love God is to understand how much God loves you and what He's done for you in order for you to come to Him through the cross and through His Son, Jesus. That's, it's, it's, not just a, it's not just a choice you make, although that is part of it. It is an understanding of how much God has done for you. And, and then when we begin to realize how much God has done for us, we begin to reflect that into our workplaces and into our lives, into our places of influence. And, and um, our primary calling, if you think about the implications of this, it's kind of huge because a lot of what goes on in work is not about loving people. Who knows what I'm talking about? Sometimes it may seem like it's the opposite. But if you begin to think through, use your minds and pray about how can I love people more through what I do, you'll find that any, anything, whether it be some sort of menial task, can actually become an act of worship. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? A lot of us question, oh, what am I doing? What do I have to do this? Ooh, you know, I, I've, I've asked all of those questions. Well, when we are looking at it through the lens of this is how I love people, it brings meaning that wasn't there before. Do you understand? Okay, so that was last week. You can get on the podcast and have a listen to that if you like. This week, I'm going to be talking about our, our work and our identity. How, how we actually tend to find our identity and what we do. Who knows what I'm talking about? What's the biggest question that you get asked when you go out to a party? You're in a party, Bombay party. Okay, so, so what, what, what's your name? Ryan. Okay. What's the next question? Oh, you all know. You're a genius. Uh, but th that, that is the big question. Nothing's really wrong with that question. But it helps you, helps you make conversation, which is okay. I don't want you feeling guilty for saying, what do you do from now on? Because even I ask. I'm like, uh, what do I say to this person? Because I'm a bit of an introvert. And uh, I find it a bit hard sometimes with a new person to kind of make conversation. So better than staring at the floor, I do ask, what do you do? Because then we can make a conversation about it. But, but what tends to be the problem sometimes is that, well, not sometimes, what tends to be the problem is that we attach our, 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 our identity and who we are as people to what we do. And I want to explain to you this morning that that's not the way it's meant to be. And actually, uh, when we do that, it actually leads to some pretty negative consequences, pretty negative implications. I'm going to go through that. So we're talking about the trap of finding 
identity in what we do. Firstly, I want to go to um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. In Genesis chapter 1, and also the following verse that I'm going to show you after that, in Genesis 2, verse 15, you're going to find that you're going to see what God did when He gave Adam and, well, Adam a job, okay? Look at this. He says in, it says in uh, verse 28, God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. That was the original command to Adam and Eve. Now, that was their job. That was their work. But I want to ask you something about this, this statement that God makes to them. Is, was God telling them who they are? No. They, they were already who they are. They were already these individuals that, that were made in the image of God. That was actually their identity. And, and when you begin to break down this little... There's a lot of, of stuff theologically like um, that that we could go into just in this one scripture. It's one of those scriptures that is very rich with themes that actually go throughout the whole Bible. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go through it with you. Be fruitful and increase in number. Okay? So you know what that means, right? I don't have to go too far to uh, help you understand what that means. Okay? But to do that, in order to do that, in order to be fruitful and increase in number... Um, well, there needs to be something that, that, that these extra people, these little people that get produced when you be fruitful and increase in number, uh, can do and go to. And, 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 and this is actually talking about creating cities, creating places for people um, to, to subdue, to fill the earth and then to subdue it. That word... Um, goes back to a word in Hebrew that actually means, well, it's actually the word that culture comes from. Wow. To cultivate. To cultivate. It, it, what, what God is, is, is saying is this. He's saying, go out into the world and cultivate it. He's saying, this is all yours. Okay? Now go and do something with it. That's what he's saying to Adam and Eve. Go and create something for life to happen. And this this amazing partnership, once again, that God wants to have with us as His people, where He doesn't just sort of go, okay, I'm creating you, you're my beings, you just be there and play in the corner, and I'm just going to... It's not what that is about. He's like, go out, be fruitful, increase, and create something. And the beautiful thing about all of this is that there is this element of, of discovery, and, and, and there's this element of discovering what God has put out there for us. And there's this element of beauty and, and wonder. And, and when you think of this in terms of science, uh, where, 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 where science is something where you discover what God has made and what God has put out there. And, 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 and when you think of it in terms of creating a city, what materials are in the ground that we can use as resources that would best sustain the elements. And it's just this amazing thing that God called mankind to. That was the beginning of everything for us as civilizations. Isn't that cool? But it was never, it was never their identity. It was more a discovery of who God is and what He can do and what He's put there for us in order for us to flourish as a people group. That's what work is. Work is actually a discovery of who God is, what He's done, and what He has put even in you. As you, as you work, you're going to find what your talents are and what your gifts are. I love burgers. I just love burgers. And I was talking to a fellow the other day at Elijah's soccer's class, soccer's, soccer's class, soccer class, and, uh, and him and his wife were there, and they've kind of become friends, and the wife was sitting there, and uh, my friend Skunder, who's not here, he had just come in from Dubai, and he had bought a Burger King burger for Elijah, 
and was dropping past Bandra, because we're in Bandra, and he said, I've got this Burger King burger for Elijah to have. He, he, can, I, can I just drop it off to you? And I said, oh, that's sweet to my friend. Oh, my mate, he's come in from Dubai. He's dropping off this. And, and the wife goes, oh, my gosh, I feel like a burger. <laughs> and I said, well, I have a friend who has just started a little burger company. And uh, it's amazing. You need to check it out. Uh, it's called Bay City Grill. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I loved watching. I'm giving you a shameless plug today, man. You're going to sell so many burgers tonight. But I loved watching C. Joe as he came into this city, discovering things about this city. C. Joe now can tell you where to get the cheapest pickles. Now, he may or may not tell you, but he knows <laughs> where to buy those pickles. C. Joe even discovered ingredients that we thought were illegal than people that were selling them. And we were like, wow, that's amazing. C. Joe discovered so many things about this city. And, and see, that's the, that's the example I'm making about work. Uh, we got Mr. Seymour here, principal of, a, of, a, of an amazing school. <laughs> I know for him, every year that he graduates, children that he's seen from year one right through to year 10. I get confused because in Australia it's year 12. What he has discovered in some of those children or in all of those children over the years is incredible about what God puts in a person. I know we got Hermani here with her company making dresses making all of the stuff that she does, discovering what fabrics are out there, what, what things there are to use and what stuff and, 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 and creating these amazing dresses and, and taking it out. Into, it's, 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 that's the beauty of work. Okay, we've got so many more businesses here. Hands up if you want to mention. I just, if I've forgotten anything, anyone. Uh, yeah. Ah, Travel. Chandrika, come on, give her a clap. <laughs> Discovering the world, helping people discover what's out there, helping businessmen, because that's what you work with a lot. You connect all these big businessmen to get around fast. And uh, man, uh, Chandrika, I was going to say her money. Chandrika, if you call her, like, I need a flight, she's like, I'm on it, boom, and she's on it. And then, boom, you get this email, and it's like, you just pay for it. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. She's so efficient in that. See, see it's, it's, it's about discovery. It's about the beauty. It's about loving people. You know, it's about helping people. That's what work is. And that's what, how God actually meant it to be. You understand? Got some actors here. It's about reflecting art to people. Reflecting society. That, that is another way of helping people. So many things I could go on, but time is escaping me. So, so Jesus, I mean God, yeah, Jesus, God, whatever. Uh, sorry, I'm getting myself mixed up here. I just don't want to confuse you. In, 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 in chapter 15 of verse 2, he says, it says here that the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. That was his job. This world was something that we were given as a gift to discover, to create, to love people through. And in that, cities would be built, societies would be framed. Amazing things would happen as we discover what God has done with His creations, us, and what He's done in this world. But sin and separation and the fall created this problem where man had an identity crisis. When sin happened, and what sin does is it separates you from God. And the reason why we are here as a church is to help people rediscover their relationship that they can have with God through the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what we're here to do. That's why we do the journey series, because we want people to discover Christ. We want them to know who He is and what He has for them. But what happened 
in the garden when they were sent out because of sin. Man, because they lost their connection with God in terms of their relationship, they began to look for identity in other means. And if you go on down into um, chapter 11 of Genesis, you come to a place called the, uh, I think it's, uh, oh, what was it called? It's, it's like a place in, uh, yeah, Shinar. Sounds like a place in, up in uh, Srinagar where, uh, what is it, Kashmir? Sounds like somewhere, something up in Kashmir. In Genesis 11, we have the Tower of Babel. And look at the, look at the progression or the digression, okay? Uh, I'll read it to you. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. That would be very boring. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. So they found a new technology. They used brick instead of stone and bitumen for mortar. So all of a sudden they're like, man, we can build something amazing out of this. Something that we've never been able to do. Okay, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heaven. And listen to this, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Just listen to that, so that we can make a name for themselves. See, it's no longer about discovery. It's no longer about beauty. It's no longer about serving. It's no longer about helping each other. It's no longer about creating a place to be fruitful. But now it's about making a name. Man had had a complete identity crisis. Come to now, this day and age, the system that this world tells you that in order for you to be something, in order for you to, to make a name for yourself, in order for you to actually be meaningful as a person, you need to work and do it and you need to prove it. Do you understand? Now, what does this lead to? What does this actually ultimately bring out? Well, I'll tell you what it leads to. When we are fighting for our own personal significance out there in the world, because that's what the world tells us we need to do, what ends up happening is competition. You can put that slide up. Competition, disunity, and strife. Because everybody's trying to prove who they are. And when someone comes along who has, or seems like they have more value than you, what do we do with that person? Because we ourselves are striving for our, ident our identity and what we do and what we put our hand to. When someone comes along and does it better than us, how do you feel about that? Do you feel amazing, peaceful? At peace and one with the universe? I don't think so. You feel like terrible. You feel defeated. And we have these crises. Like, well, what, what is it? Well, I, don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I, I can't. What is it that I, I was born for? And we have these crises. And, and, and our lives can end up feeling somewhat meaningless. Because work was never meant to be our identity. And when it becomes our identity, it leads to behavior that is not of God and not what He actually meant for you and I. In fact, I would hazard to say that when everything centers around what we do, and our whole identity comes out of that, it leads to sin that we just wish we could break free of. I think pride, we talk about pride, you know, oh, I don't want to be prideful, I don't want to be proud. Pride is a funny old thing. It's very subtle. It's, 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 it's a very... It's like... Cancer is one of those diseases that's so scary because it just sneaks up on a person and they don't know what's there. 
until it's too late. Pride's like that. And I, I, I am only saying this because I know in myself how much I have struggled and struggle on a day-to-day basis with something like pride. My pride, 99% of the time, comes out of my own identity crisis. Because I want to tell myself that I'm better than someone else. Do you understand? Because it makes me feel what? Secure. I draw this false security, and I think we all do as people. Whatever our work is, whatever it is that we put our hands to, I think to say that I can do it better than someone else makes us feel somewhat secure. And that can drive a person for their entire life to be better than everybody else and to show the world. Well, if everyone's doing that, what kind of world do we end up with? Our identity was never meant to come from what we do. It's impossible. It leads to sin. It leads to yuckiness. It leads to a world that is against each other. We're all on the surface, so hey, how are you? But underneath, underneath, There's these thoughts, there's this competition, there's this disunity, there's this strife. You know what I'm talking about. C.S. Lewis, an amazing author, uh, wrote the Narnia Chronicles. He was kind of like a, 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 a Christian philosopher. He wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And uh, here's, a, here's a quote from him. He said this, Now what I want you to get clear is that pride is essentially competitive. It is competitive by its very nature. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something. Hear this. Pride gets no pleasure about having something. Only out of having more than the next man. We say people are proud of being rich or good looking but they're not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. See, this is what, when we find our identity in what we do, this is where it leads to. Because you always got to be better than someone else. And what it leads us out of is to a place Like the Tower of Babel, let us build something that will build a name for ourselves. At least at the end of my days, someone will remember me for. Ah, even I, Look, I'm telling you something that I've struggled with and I'm preaching to myself here. But this is not what God created us for. It's not. The strife, the pain, the hurt struggle, the internal wrestling that this all leads to is not what Jesus wants for you. It's not why He died on the cross for you. That is not a demonstration of His love for you. And my question is, what kind of world does this actually lead to? We see it on a bigger scale, where we have massive trade wars, where we have massive bombs going off in countries and people creating chemicals to put on their own people and kill them off and we see the oppressed taken advantage of because the person taking advantage feels that they're better than the oppressed and it gives them a right to do what they do. See what it leads to when our identity is found in what we do? And it's not just on an individual, on an individual basis that, it, that this affects us, it affects us as people groups. You get people groups coming together and saying, well, we're better. That's what racism comes out of. Do you understand? It's an identity crisis, right? And it leads to a world that is just at each other. It's not God's plan. What God planned for us was hope, was beauty, was discovery. Well, you see something like science, which was really 
just the discovery of what God has done, becoming something that has given mankind the power to blow up its very own existence. <laughs> it's not what God wanted. So what's the answer to all of this? What's, what's, the, what's the, the healing balm? I've, I've created a bit of tension in the room. And I know you're all like, whoa, okay, I didn't think of it like that. Well, I want to bring some scriptures to you to help you understand what God actually wants for us in terms of your identity. So that the way you view your work and what you do is no longer your identity anymore, but it's just an act of love. It's an act of serving. It's not an act of trying to find who you are because you are not found in what you do. You're found in Christ. I said, you're not found in what you do. You're found in Christ. That is where you're going to discover who you are. That is where you're going to discover what God has for you. There's going to be a peace that comes in your world that no matter what happens, even if you lose your job, you're still going to be okay and secure because this is my confidence. You'll never failed me yet. I forgot the words, so thank you, Mary Ann, for reminding me. Let me check this out. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, verse 22 to 24. Oh, it's up there. I'll just read it from here. But the father, this is the prodigal son. I want you to see this. The prodigal son had, you know the story, had run away from his dad, had spent all of his inheritance. He had made his dad cash in his retirement fund before he retired and said, I want my money now before you die. Wouldn't that be nice if your son did that to you? Before you die, dad, I want what's to me in my will, in your, in your will. And the father was somehow loving enough in the story to give it to his son and just lets him go. And he goes out, spends it all, gets into a place where he's in a pigsty looking after pigs and is so hungry because he hasn't been eating and is getting paid such a meager wage that he's looking at what they're feeding the, pot, the pigs and that he's going, I wouldn't mind eating that. It's, they're just starting to look like CJ's hamburgers. He's like, hmm, I want one of those right now. And, 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 and then he goes, he comes to his, 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 uh, his, his senses and he goes, hold on a second, there's hamburgers back at my dad's house. Uh, I tell you what, I'll go and make an offer to my dad. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say to him, I'm going to be a slave in your house. Would you accept me as, an ex as a slave and I'll work for you? And he's like, at least then I'll be fed. He comes home and this is, this is him coming home. Then the father said to his servants, quick, when he comes home, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the skinny calf and kill it. The fattened calf, the one that's, you know, the one that you're fattening up for Christmas, right? Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Yes, they did eat non veg Okay, whatever. <laughs> Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What's the ring about? What's the, what's the sandals about? What's the robe about? What's all that about? I'll tell you what it's about. It's about identity. It's about who he is and whose son he is. It's about whose daughter he is, she is. Well, you never know in this world anymore. It's about whose daughter, whose son. That's the point I'm trying to make. When we come back home to Christ, He puts a ring on your finger. He puts a robe on your back. He puts sandals on your feet. And those are marks of someone who has come home. Those are marks of someone who belongs to a certain family that you only get when you come home to Him. Another scripture is, is 1 Peter, chapter, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. 
He says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. You were looking around for what it is that your life was meant to be. You're looking to your work for your identity. You're looking for, you're having this identity crisis about you're this old and you've gotten this far and looked back and you go, what have I done? And all of these sorts of things. Once you were not a people, but now, but now, who are you? People of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Mercy, there's a ring on your finger, there's a robe on your back, there's sandals on your feet. There is a new skip in your step because you know who you are. And you're no longer, even if you're scrubbing out a toilet in the backwaters of Gujarat or Kerala or whatever. Backwaters, backwaters, I get it, yeah, backwaters, yeah. Doesn't matter because you know whose you are and that is where you're deriving your identity from. Could you imagine the world if there was a group of people that were so confident in who they are, it did not matter what came their way. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. I love this scripture. It says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord, your God has chosen you. Has chosen you. Look at the person next to you and say, You're chosen. And then tell them something else. And I'm chosen too. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be who? To be who? Who are you? His people. His treasured possession. Some of you all don't believe this. You don't believe it. You don't, because you're still looking for your work, the stuff that you do to be your identity. You're not going to find it there. You've got to understand you are his treasured possession and that means something. There is an identity that you have and some of you just need to reach out and grab it right now and take your hands off the stuff that you're trying to discover your identity from. And, and, and as you do that, as you go to work, it's not going to be something where you're trying to prove who you are anymore, but it's going to be, wow, this is amazing. I didn't realize I could do this. I didn't realize God could do this through me. I didn't realize this about this. I didn't realize this about that. I didn't realize the beauty that was here in this people group. I didn't realize what it becomes, this amazing walk of a lifetime of discovery of what God can do through you, what God wants to do in this world, what God wants to do in order to make this world the place that He actually wants it to be. And He wants to do that through you. Right. He wants to do it through you. When we have a confidence in Christ... In our identity, it changes everything. But I want to challenge you this morning, this afternoon, to just reflect on this question. And let's take a moment to turn to God. I'm not asking this question to make anyone feel bad, guilty, shameful. I'm asking this question so that you can get free of a pathway that you're on that only leads your way from God. I'm inviting you to take a new path. The path of finding your identity in Christ. If you've been working and trying to prove yourself through what you do. Let's make today the last day of that and a new day of finding our discovery or finding our identity in Christ and who He is. Yeah. 
Mumbai is a church in the heart of India's commercial capital, where a diverse group of people brought together to worship God and to pass on the hope of salvation by grace that we freely received. For more information about C3 Mumbai, please visit our website c3mumbai.com or visit our Facebook page. Follow us on Instagram or tweet us on our handle at C3 Mumbai. Hey, it's Ryan here. If you enjoyed this message and you live in Mumbai, we would love to meet you in person. Why don't you come along 11.30 a.m. Studio 10 at Famous Studios in Mahalakshmi.